Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and we now turn the clock to the 29th of August 1651. So you're probably thinking what's going on uh, around Worcester in the run up to the Battle of Worcester? What was happening on the 29th of August? Well very simply things got very very serious for Choles and the Royalists in Worcester. Remember the Mayor officially stated that he wanted the Scots to come in probably spend 24 hours in the city and then continue their campaign heading down to London. Remember, that was Charles's aim at the end of the day. The only problem is Charles has stayed in the city longer than 24 hours and his army has pretty much taken over. So they've uh, restored a lot of the defences. Um, they've barricaded some of the gates shut, for example. So they're actually looking now that this is going to be the site of a large battle if not a battle then a siege now what is quite interesting on today's date um the vulnerability of worcester was really illustrated because today uh 369 years ago the parliamentarians under, under oliver cromwell uh had actually moved up on the high ground around worcester now if you ever visit worcester if you're not from worcester you will notice when you enter the city or you come into worcester you have to come down a hill for example if you come off one of the motorway junctions you end up coming down for example london road and you will come down to the city with the cathedral at the bottom if you are coming along, for example, Aswood Road, for example, and you've gone up onto the top of Rainbow Hill, once again, to enter Worcester, you're coming down Rainbow Hill and into Lowesmore. So if you think about it, Worcester is actually in a hollow. It's not strategically placed, to be fair, unless you look at the city centre way back in prehistoric times. And then really you've got the Little Mound, which is where the cathedral is. That's where Worcester developed from. But by 1651, Worcester was in a bit of a hollow with high ground going all the way around the outside. So it doesn't really matter if your walls around the city are six foot or 10 foot high, uh, the enemy can see in. They can look straight down into the high street, for example, in the city center. So let's just update you and we'll see where all this high ground is and also what they're called. So for tonight's video, we're going to use our board. So here we have a zoomed in picture of the city of Worcester and if you remember I did a sketch uh, earlier in the week showing Worcestershire when the parliamentarians and the royalists were all moving in well now we're going to concentrate on the locality of the city centre so there we have Worcester city centre and obviously like all these drawings they are not to scale roads and probably not in the right place and obviously the size of the river team in the river seven uh, is is not accurate at all really especially if you look at the size of the city bridge compared with the little dots that are representing the houses so there we have Worcester and it was a medieval walled city and remember there was some earthworks added on these had appeared um, during the siege of Worcester in 1646 and remember there was that period where they were slighted at the end of the siege of Worcester and then by the time of the Worcester campaign they started to be reconstructed by the Worcester militia to protect the city from the Scots and then when the Worcester militia withdrew they were partially slighted again and what you have to remember is Charles has set the whole of the county to be fair to restore those defences and like I said if you go to Salwalk Church you will find a letter in there one of the many letters that went out ordering people from the county to restore the defences at Worcester so Worcester sits here predominantly on the east uh, uh, bank of the River Severn however we must not forget there was a suburb uh, in St John's including St John's Church where when uh, all Covid-19 restrictions are gone we'll be back there doing uh, local history talks one a month that will be um, and we then have coming down from the River Severn the river team cutting in the side there and there's quite a big uh, loop in the river team which is still visible even to this date and then just down here by Poet Bridge uh, further south you've got Poet Village, Poet Church as well and the high ground is predominantly on the eastern side of Worcester so 
this side is pretty flat until really you get to the Malvern Hill. So it's predominantly floodplain on the western side. But I have drawn a dotted line and you will notice I've got little red blocks. Now, on the 29th of August, 1651, Cromwell, who was down in Eversham, had actually ordered some of his men, not all of them, but some of his men, to begin the full encirclement of the city. Now, he'd already done that at a great distance, but as many people say, he's tightening the noose around the royalists at this point. So, end of August, they're starting to tighten the noose. Now, down here, we know some Parliament guns, and in particular, some Parliament soldiers, had moved into the area of Bunns Hill. Now, that's going to be important because strategically, when you get the Battle of Worcester on the 3rd of September, um, the guns up here on Bunns Hill does cause a bit of damage, shall we say. And I'm not going to spoil the story. It does a bit of damage on the Royalists that are on the floodplain over here. So we've got some troops moving up to Bunns Hill and then more troops across here between Red Hill and Perry Wood. Now here's an interesting fact. If you know the Red Hill area, and remember Red Hill does not get its name from the battle. It was a name given to it before that, mainly because if they were going to do a proper uh, hanging, drawing and quartering, people went out of the city and it was actually done on Red Hill. So the name usually comes fa from the fact that hangings, drawings and quarterings were done there. In the 1605 gunpowder plot, for example, uh, several of the plotters, including Edward Oldcorn, later be known as Blessed Edward, named after the Catholic school, he was actually hang drawn and quartered up there. So uh, Red Hill. But if you wander around in the Red Hill area, you will find things such as Cromwell Crescent. You'll also find streets called uh, Camp Hill. Well, that's all referring to the fact that from the 29th of August 1651, some of Cromwell's troops, not all of them, but some of Cromwell's troops were actually moved in to the high ground on the eastern side. So these street names are really relating to Cromwell's men, Cromwell's Crescent, uh, Camp Hill, for example. So this is where the soldiers were camped prior to the battle. So as well as Buns Hill in Red Hill, as you go further over, you've also got Perry Wood and you have to remember the old London Road, not the present London Road, but the old London Road actually snaked up through Perry Wood. And if you're wandering to Perry Wood today, you may see the sunken lane running all the way through. And then further over, you've got Albury Hill, which personally I believe is a prehistoric uh, hill fort or a prehistoric settlement up here. And then as you go further over, you will eventually come to Rainbow Hill. And that is pretty much all this high ground on the south and eastern side. And if you remember, to the north of the city, and we're talking quite a distance, we have Bewdley and there's Parliament troops up there. So the noose has actually really come in now. And the Royalists in the city, we know on the 29th of August 1651, saw these troops appearing. And if you're a bit of a fan of the film Zulu, like myself and Ian, it's very much that moment when the Zulus turn up all the way around Islandwana. So they've turned up and they're all, uh, Rourke's Drift I should say, and they all stand up there and they're looking down at the uh, the, the troops uh, at, the, at the mission station. So. It's a very dangerous moment now. We've got all these troops starting to appear on the high ground. Worcester is looking unbelievably uh, um, vulnerable. And what happened is when the guns were moved into place, as well as these soldiers were moved into place, uh, Cromwell gave orders to test the firepower of the Royalist forces. So what would have happened is Parliament guns on all this high ground started to bombard the city defences. And we know from the accounts of the day, they did a fair bit of damage. You have to remember, is cannonballs are flying into the city wall, the old sandstone walls that are said to be crumbling uh, throughout the Civil War. They were always being remarked as being crumbling walls. And they're old. These are 13th century walls. We also know cannonballs were... Um, raining down into Gabion Age and this is basically wicker work in, in big baskets full of earth which was designed to stop bullets really so these are being split wide open they're being thrown into the air by these solid iron cannonballs being flown into them 
And uh, if you're a citizen and you haven't fled Worcester, uh, and some people didn't, uh, it would have been deadly. You would have had these iron cannonballs flying through your roof, through your front door, uh, through your bedroom windows. It would have been pretty scary stuff. And there was two reasons behind this artillery bombardment. The first one uh, was to find out where the enemy guns were, because the usual tactic of the day is when you fire upon your enemy, the enemy will return fire. It's, it's basic rules of arms going back even into the age of archers, for example. You shoot, they will shoot back at you. So when you bombard the city, you look out for the smoke and the noise, in fact, of the enemy guns. And we know Cromwell noticed that the Royalists didn't have many guns. And it's a known fact. The Royalists had a handful of guns that were left in the city by the militia. The militia actually tried to get rid of some of them, but there weren't many. There was not, uh, Worcester was not heavily defended uh, by artillery. And we also know a few light guns were carried down from Scotland. And these were um, famously known as leather guns. And these are made by having a very thin iron barrel. And these are very dangerous. They're almost disposable. There is no way I would love to fire one of these things. A relatively thin barrel. Then they're surrounded with rope and they're put all the way around. That really holds the thing together and prevents it from splitting wide open on the first shot. And then they are stitched into a leather sleeve and that holds the rope against the ironwork. So a leather cannon. So they're not leather chewed, but it's the leather that encases the rope and the thin ironwork, really. And we know that they had some of those, but the artillery the Royalists had was very, very small amounts and nothing big, nothing major, uh, no big siege guns or anything like that. But to be fair, the parliamentarians didn't need siege guns. This is going to be an open battle. So you need sakers, you need robinettes. So the guns fire onto the city and they return fire. And like we said, that's one of the reasons for bombarding the city. Where is the enemy sighted their guns? Because when they fire back, you make a note of where these guns are. The second reason for the bombardment is to terrify the royalists. Because the idea is if you bombard them from the high ground with big guns uh, or, or even, the, or even the, the smaller guns, you are going to terrify them. They're going to be there uh, horrified by the firepower that the enemy's got. So it's psychological as well, really. Um, so the artillery bombardment of Worcester began today. As soon as they moved into the high ground, uh, the parliamentarians started firing cannons. It wasn't a 24 hours, seven days a week bombardment, but you would have had sporadic firing into the city and it would have been testing the metal of the Scots that were now occupying the city. Now, we know at some point, and many people say it was in the hours of darkness, so probably about now, to be fair, almost nine o'clock at night, um, there was a bit of skirmishing going on. In other words, the Scots were coming out to try and uh, move the parliamentarians from the high ground. Now, we know that two particular people, that is Major Knox and uh, William Keith, who later commands Poet Bridge in the actual Battle of Worcester on the 3rd of September, they actually came out with about a thousand men and about 250 cavalry. And they actually came out of Sidbury with an aim of pushing the enemy from this area here, Buns Hill and Red Hill. Now, here's an interesting fact. The plans to silence the guns up here, to attack the guns up here, was overheard, and it was overheard in Worcester by a man called William Guise, and this is a fantastic story. Now, William Guise supposedly shimmied over the wall. It was said he threw a rope over the wall and let himself outside the city walls because the city is pretty much in lockdown now. And what he actually did is William Guise went up to find Oliver Cromwell's men. And the story has it that he told Cromwell's men, especially around here, that there was an attack on its way, an imminent attack. The parliamentarians uh, were going to be attacked by some royalists. They were going to sally out and push them off that hill. And famously, it is said that William Guise then went back into the city, got back over the wall and carried on as if nothing happened. Now, for some people, this man is an absolute hero for Worcester. Other people often refer to him as a traitor. What we know about him is the fact that the guns 
and the positions up here were waiting for those royalists. And famously, when the royalists got up there, uh, the parliamentarians who knew they were coming fired on them, ambushed them, basically. But we know William Guise was later found in the city. He was found guilty of tallying the enemy, basically, uh, on what the plans were um, under Major Knox and uh, William Keith, this, this attack on the guns up there. And he was hanged, and he was famously hanged by the Golden Cross Inn in Broad Street, and he was hanged. And the interesting thing is, and the fantastic story this is about William Guise, is his family was given compensation by Oliver Cromwell because... Uh, he was seen as a hero. He was the man that helped the parliamentarians. And this is supposedly the faithful city again. Absolute rubbish, if you ask me. Um, but the other interesting thing is if you go into the old Golden Lion pub on the high street, now affectionately known as Costa, opposite the Guild Hall, you will find the death mask of William Guise. William Guise's death mask is inside, but that's the fake one. The real one, if you get a chance and you ask the staff, is actually outside in the uh, passageway out in the yard. So it's worth having a look at. The Civil War is all around Worcester. You've just got to look for it, basically. Um, but famously, um, as the Royalists came out to attack the guns up here on Buns Hill and Red Hill, uh, the parliamentarians were waiting for them. And famously, uh, Major Knox leapt over a hedge, it was said. And I've got a quote here. It's a fantastic quote. Uh, Major Knox was killed. Uh, he leapt over a hedge on his horse. And the description of what happened to him uh, is, 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 is interesting, shall we say. It says, coming very boldly up and leaping over a hedge, rushed upon a stand of pikes. And so he lost his life in a vapour. In other words, Major Knox galloped, jumped over a hedge, big block of pikemen, Parliament pikemen waiting for him up here. And he was killed instantly, basically. So even though the guns were in position on the 29th of August, even though Chol sent some men out to deal with them because of William Guise, the parliamentarians were ready and waiting. And famously, that was another disaster. You've probably gathered there is one disaster after another. Wigan, Warrington, the failed musters here, the encirclement of the Scots. It's not looking good. Anyway, hopefully that's updated you and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.